I wanted to film this on another day, but I ran out of time and couldn't, and so if the lighting is weird, that's why it's much later than I normally film. So for quite a while now, I have been curious, and I've been searching around to see if I can find a Twilight clone that is actually good. And I made a video about what I mean by Twilight clone a while ago. You can check it out here if you haven't already seen it. Basically, it's, you know, after Twilight came out, there was that huge boom in books, which also kind of spilled over into movies and other stuff, uh, where a teenage girl finds some sort of supernatural boy, and then they fall in love, and there may be some other adventures outside of that. They range from being absolutely horrendous to just kind of boring and dull to kind of okay, but I have not found any good ones until now. See, I recently read the Elemental series, and I will say right now, it's pretty good. You know, the characters are not just two-dimensional blank slates. They have actual personality and actual depth to them, and so you understand why they are the way they are and why they do what they do, even if you don't agree with them and even if you find them frustrating. Uh, it makes sense for the magical world to be hidden in this, because part of the criteria for being a true Twilight clone, at least to me, is that it has to be in the real world with some sort of hidden magical underworld there. And the story to the series has real twists, and it has genuine moments of tension in it. Like, I'm, I'm being dead serious here. I'm not being sarcastic, and I'm not even really grading on a curve or anything. I just, I genuinely liked the Elemental series. By the time I finished the first book, I was, well, one, I was, like, genuinely really shocked by the quality of this, even if it's not, like, mind-blowing, the greatest thing I've ever read. I was shocked that it wound up actually being enjoyable and actually being good. Uh, but I also knew from that moment that, like, yeah, I'm going to have to make a video on this at some point. So several months later, here we are. And basically, I'm going to summarize this whole story and review it as I go, kind of similar to my other super long in-depth book reviews, except this one is not going to have as much detail, and it is going to be generally positive. There's, there's criticisms that I will make, but it's generally going to be positive. The short version of this, if you don't want to watch the whole thing, is just that it is genuinely a good series. It's not as focused as I would prefer it to be, but the characters do have genuine personalities, and they do have chemistry with one another, and like I said before, the story is actually pretty good. So, if that interests you at all, maybe check it out. And like I said, I'm not going to go into ex excruciating detail, so there will be some story beats I don't touch on, which may still interest you. And also, the timelines in these books can get a little weird, so if I do things out of order, or if I accidentally mess up on small details, I just apologize in advance for that. But they're just... There are a lot of events that <laughs> admittedly get kind of repetitive after a while, and they kind of blend together, so me going over them in this format may be confusing. I apologize in advance, but anyways, uh, spoilers from this point on, so let's go into the first book, which is called Storm. Just trust yourself, man. Trust your instincts. My instincts are telling me to throw this controller through the fucking screen. This book starts off with a bit of a bang, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, it starts with the main character, whose name is Becca, leaving a self-defense class at night, and she's thinking about how, oh, she wasted her time, she wasted her money, and when she's in the parking lot going to her car, she sees a boy getting beaten up by a couple other boys. She knows she has to help him, but unfortunately her phone is dead and she can't call the police or anything, so she just gets in her car, drives her car at them threateningly until they run off, and then she picks up the boy, who she sees is uh, one of her classmates at school, she doesn't know him super well, his name is Chris, and one, she sees that he's very, very badly beaten. He's very, he's barely conscious. He's clearly injured pretty badly. This wasn't just a couple of bruises and some cuts. Like, he, this kid's in trouble. She wants to take him to the hospital, but he insists on her driving him home, so that's what she does. So I just want to say right off the bat, this is pretty good, and it's a massive improvement over what you would normally expect from this genre. Like, it, one, pulled me into the story, I was wondering, okay, what's going on here? But two, it actually made me like Becca, you know? It, in so many of these books, the heroines are just weak, and I, I think you can blame Twilight for a huge part of that, but, you know, in that story, Bella doesn't really do anything to save the day, she doesn't really do anything to help Edward, and that carries over to so many of these other uh, clones, let's say. But in this case, it starts off with 
Becca, the main character, actually doing something and actually helping somebody out and doing something kind of heroic. So right off the bat, I liked her and I realized that she wasn't just going to be some sort of passive wallflower in their relationship because, you know, obviously the first dude she meets in the story has to be the one she falls in love with. That's just the rule. Now, like I said, Chris is beaten pretty badly, but she no uh, Becca notices that when he drinks water and when he gets splashed with water, it seems to heal him a little bit and energize him a bit. And Becca thinks that's weird, but she doesn't dwell on it too much. And she takes him home to his brothers because uh, he lives with his three older brothers. Their parents died a couple of years earlier. Uh, the oldest one is named Michael, and he has custody of his other brothers because he was 18 when his parents died, and he, I believe he's 23 during the events of this series, so it's been about five years. Uh, and then there are two twins named Gabriel and Nick who are both 17 years old, and then there's Chris who's the youngest at 16 years old. So there are four brothers here, and Elemental is in the title. I think you can figure out what goes on from there in terms of at least what sort of powers they have, but, you know... Not a big deal, it's just a thing I had to mention. So, uh, when she brings him there, his brothers are concerned about him, but they also know he'll be okay soon, and we find out that they have actually had trouble with the boys that beat him up before. One of them is named uh, Seth, and one of them is named Tyler. Now, as Becca is telling them about everything that happened, Gabriel, one of the twins, thinks that she's suspicious, and he tries to keep her from leaving, and he basically tries to interrogate her, and almost physically blocks the her, her way out, and then she just runs off and gets in her car and drives away. Now, honestly, after finishing the series, and hell, even before finishing the book, this was a weird moment, because, like, it does make sense that Gabriel would be kind of suspicious of her, but him, like, physically blocking someone from leaving when she's clearly scared and just wants to leave, does not fit him at all, and it makes him seem like much more of an asshole than he really is. Like, I don't know, it's just a very out-of-character moment, and uh, I think it was put there to try and make this seem like more dangerous and more tense and more mysterious, I guess, but I don't know, I, I feel like you should have gone through and rewritten that a bit. So anyways, right after this we follow Chris for a little while, and we find out pretty quickly what's going on. Basically, uh, some people in this world are what's called elementals, and they basically have power of one of the four elements, water, air, fire, and earth, and all four of the Merrick brothers, that's what they're called, that's, their last name's Merrick, uh, is one of them. Chris is water, Gabriel's fire, Nick is air, and the oldest one, Michael, is earth. It's nice for them to tell us pretty early on, rather than just dragging us along for a very long time, because, you know, we know from reading the summary and everything what's going to happen, at least in broad strokes. We know what's going on, so it's nice that both the audience and Becca also finds out pretty early on as well. It's nice that we just skip over that and get to the actual story bit, you know? I like that. Obviously, you can overdo that and just have it be right at the beginning, everyone already knows everything, but you know, the way it was done here was pretty well. And anyways, Chris wakes up, and him and his brother Gabriel uh, decide to get back at them, at Tyler and Seth, for beating him up, so they place some bags of fertilizer at Tyler's house, and some lightning comes and strikes the fertilizer, and there's a big explosion. <laughs> Obviously, the police show up when they hear about this, and they just tell them, yeah, it was an accident, it was a prank gone wrong, because, you know, they can't just tell them, hey, we're, we're magical, and we were uh, not exactly trying to kill this guy, but we were trying to do something very dangerous near him and his property. And that is actually one thing I feel the need to mention as well, is that when crazy shit goes down, the police actually show up, and while there aren't a whole lot of major characters who are involved with the police or government or anything like that, it, it is nice that they don't just disappear, so you're not left wondering, wouldn't someone show up if there was this giant battle with explosions and stuff? Like, no, they... They do show up, and it is a consideration that the heroes have to take take into account. Now, as we're learning about the elementals and what they can do, we also learn that they used to actually rule over humans. Like, way back thousands and thousands of years ago in ancient times, they used to, you know, conquer cities and destroy armies and cause earthquakes and shit. So, having elementals around was kind of a very serious problem. And so what happened were these guys called, who call themselves the Guides, they're another secret society, came along and decided to police the elementals. And 
We don't get a whole lot of specifics about like how all this started. It's just, you know, kind of vague legends that we hear about. But it sounds to me like the guides tried to commit genocide and just kill all of the elementals. And my theory there is backed up based on what a lot of the guides do throughout this series. Uh, but because of that, all the remaining elementals have just decided to keep a low profile. And basically, they just don't make a big deal out of having powers, they don't kill a whole bunch of people, they don't destroy a bunch of stuff. And the guides either, well, there's different factions of them, but basically they will either not notice them, and so they're safe, or they'll notice them, but they will see that they're not making any trouble, and so they'll leave them alone because they have bigger fish to fry. So it actually makes sense why all the magical stuff is hidden in this series. You know? Like, I, I've mentioned this so many times, and so few authors ever take it into account, but like, even if in the modern world, modern technology would allow humans to fight whatever magical creatures or magical societies there are that are mentioned in the series, uh, they wouldn't have been able to do that in ancient times, at least in most cases. So I'm always left wondering, well, why didn't the vampires or whatever just conquer all the humans back then and rule over them forever and prevent them from even trying to develop this kind of technology. Like, that's a question I always ask, and this is one of the few series that actually answers it. So Becca gets harassed a bunch by Seth and Tyler, like, while she's at her job and while she's at school and stuff, and a bunch of kids at school keep calling her a slut for reasons we aren't totally sure of at the beginning, but they become clear later, we'll get to that. And uh, while Seth and Tyler, Seth and Tyler are uh, harassing her at her job, she meets a new kid who starts going to her school named Hunter and they become pretty quick friends because Hunter helps her out and drives off the other two. Hunter not only has a very well-trained dog, who used to be a police dog, his name's Casper, and he's a good boy, uh, but he's also just a very good fighter himself, and he actually shows her a few self-defense techniques over the course of the story, and she thinks about how, wow, this is much better than that class I tried to take. Now, from here, a lot of the story is kind of mundane, uh, I, I don't want to say high school drama because that just sounds dumb, but that's basically what it is. Like, we're getting to know these characters and the difficulties they have in their lives and, like, their hidden secrets, their hidden flaws, their hidden torments. I, I don't know, the things that cause them problems and that uh, they hate about themselves and about the world. And it works really well. Like, all the magic stuff is just kind of building in the background. Like, it's there. Like I mentioned, uh, after this, Becca does find out about the magical world and the elementals and everything and her and Chris start growing closer, but it's not the main focus of the story at first. And then about the halfway point, they go to a party, and Tyler and some others, like, just straight up attack it. Like, they shoot at people <laughs> with a fucking gun. Uh, they throw fire. There's, like, kind of an explosion, etc. And no one dies from what we hear, but it seems like... Uh, I don't know, it just seems stupid on Tyler's part. We also find out that something really bad happened to Becca over the summer, but we don't know exactly what, and as I said before, we will get into that as the details are revealed. So during this whole altercation, Chris actually saves Becca's life, and he later explains to her that basically his parents and Tyler's parents all died in the same house fire, and we don't know the exact origins of this whole feud, but basically they're both elemental families, and they were fighting for some reason, and Tyler and Michael, Chris's oldest brother, were fighting with each other, and it escalated, and eventually uh, Tyler's sister died in an accident, and this is all covered in one of the spin-off novellas, which is just called Elemental, and I will say right now the novella doesn't really add anything because we learn all this backstory throughout the regular series, but whatever, not important. And basically, Tyler just blames them not just for his sister's death, but for his parents' death. And the only reason this hasn't erupted into all-out war is because both sides are worried that the guides are going to come after them. And Chris specifically vocalizes, thinking like, yeah, he's making a big show of this. Someone's going to come after us. I'm worried. I'm scared. Coincidentally, this is also when Becca's deadbeat dad shows up, who she hasn't spoken to in years. And when she gets uh, out of her house and first sees him, she sees that there's a pentagram painted on their door, and her dad's cleaning it off. He just says, oh, some kids are messing around, I guess. But the pentagram is a sign that people put up when they want the guides to come after someone there. So she realizes, okay, I'm in the crosshairs now too. 
Now what? Becca and some of the others nearly die when a bridge explodes underneath them while they're driving over it. And officially it's an accident, but they do blame the guides for it and they think, okay, they're coming after us. We don't know who they are or where they are, but they're somewhere around here. What are we going to do? And they try to live their lives as normal, like they try to keep a low profile because, you know, these aren't people that are members of a secret society where they can ask all their fellows for help and they know all these safe houses and stuff. These are basically just regular people who happen to have some powers that they don't get all that much practice with. After this, Becca is talking to Gabriel at his soccer practice because he's on the soccer team, and so is her ex-boyfriend, and, you know, they're all running around, and uh, we've seen her ex-boyfriend a few po times at this point, but he's not been a major character, which is why I haven't really mentioned him. And while she's talking to Gabriel, she... She doesn't come right out and say it, but she very heavily implies that she got gang by her ex-boyfriend and some of his friends, including Seth, who, remember, was the one of the guys beating up Chris at the beginning, and uh, her ex-boyfriend, like, is nearby when this happens, and Gabriel, uh, again, she doesn't outright say it, but he clearly puts two and two together, and he just immediately knocks him unconscious. It was at this moment I knew that, okay, Gabriel, while he can be a bit of an ass, is overall an okay guy. Like, he gets in trouble for it, like, we don't see a whole lot of specifics, but, you know, there's a fight on the field, so their coach runs over, other people run over, and at this point, Becca uh, gets taken away by one of her friends, so we don't see specifically what happened, but it's pretty clear everyone overhears what went down, and things escalate from there, but it's basically, it's bad news for her ex-boyfriend, and Gabriel, like I said, he becomes a much more likable character from this point forward, for the most part, but... Again, this really does not mesh with his spat with her at the very beginning of the book. I still don't like that moment. Now, like I said, word does get out about what Becca's ex and his friends did to her, and she clarifies to her friends and the other characters that, no, no, they didn't actually rape her, they just almost did. And I, I don't want to get into super detail about it, because it's unpleasant to read and it's even more unpleasant to talk about, but basically... Yeah, they, they didn't actually rape her, but they came pretty close, and so she's still pretty freaked out about it and pretty traumatized about it, but everyone in the school just heard that, oh, okay, she had sex with, like, five dudes at once, and that's why she's been getting called a slut a bunch. So later, and we're not quite at the climax of the book yet, but we're near the climax, and there's a school dance, and everyone's there just trying to have a good time, and she goes outside where her ex is smoking a cigarette by himself, and she tries to confront him, and... Uh, she sees there's some people nearby, she doesn't really pay attention to them though, and so she thinks she's safe, but then while she's yelling at him, and he gets kind of physical with her, the other people run over, she sees, oh, that's his friends, and this is going to sound weird, but they, basically her ex decides that, well, everyone already thinks I you, so I may as well actually do it, and then they'll just drag her off, and it, um... They don't actually do it, but they're about to, it's made pretty clear. And at this point, I, I'm so torn on this moment, because it sounds even stupider saying it out loud, quite frankly, but I'm torn, because on one hand, it's like they're becoming fucking cartoon villains at this point, like what kind of person thinks that way, but on the other hand, I feel like it's a frighteningly accurate depiction of how a lot of entitled young men act, so I just... I. I don't know what to make of this. Let, let me know in the comments below, uh, especially if you've read the book. Like, I, I don't know how I feel about this, but that, that is what happens. So while she's getting dragged away, she does fight back and injures several of them, like, you know, because she's fighting dirty, which is what you should do in a situation like that. You know, bite their fingers, kick them in the face, just be, be dirty, be mean. And um, Chris shows up and he does save the day, which... I'm okay with in this instance because she saved him at the beginning, he saved her at the end, they're, they're even. It's not like one of them is carrying all the water in this relationship and the other one is helpless. I, I'm actually okay with them both saving each other. Uh, but anyways, around this time, uh, a guide also attacks and there's a huge elemental battle uh, out on a soccer field. There's a miniature tornado that shows up and long story short, Chris and his brother Nick wind up getting taken somewhere and being held captive. 
After this, Hunter admits that he was actually working with the guide that was hunting them down, but he has changed his mind because he didn't realize that the guide was going to go this far with it, and he's also gotten to know, you know, Becca and Chris and them, and he wants to try and make things right. The others are rightfully pissed at him, both for doing this and for keeping it a secret, but they also realize they need his help. Nick and Chris are being held in some sort of dark concrete cell. They have no light. Uh, the guide is actually feeding them at a few points, so he clearly, clearly doesn't want to just execute them, but uh, whatever plans he has for them they know are unpleasant, but while they're in there, they have very little air, so Nick can't do much, and they have no water, so Chris can't do anything. Eventually, Chris finds a crack on the floor, and he cuts himself, and squeezes blood down in there because, you know, magic, and it makes it freeze, and it breaks open, and he's able to get out. This is around the same time that all the others finally track them down and arrive there, so him and Nick are getting out just as the others arrive, and that's also when we learn that the guide is actually Becca's dad. Very shocking. I mean, the way I described it earlier probably made it a little more obvious, but it did genuinely catch me off guard. We also learn that Becca, along with Hunter and her dad, are what's known as a fifth. Now, a fifth, th they are elementals, but, but you can also think of it as being like spirit elementals. And basically, they can use all four elements, and they also have a little bit extra. Like, they just have more connection with the emotions of others and stuff, which they don't go into a lot of detail about how it works, but basically they are even more powerful than all the others. Upon realizing what's going on, Becca's dad decides, okay, you know what, I don't want to fight you anymore, I don't want to hold you prisoner, but more guides are coming, and we need to be aware of that, and that's how the book ends. And, uh, I'll be honest, that's a very solid intro to the series. Like, it's way better than others in the genre, and while, yes, uh, uh, a lot of people would prefer for a series uh, to have a first book, which is... Pretty self-contained, but with potential for sequels, this one is pretty clearly just, okay, cliffhanger ending. But I don't mind, because like I said, I really enjoyed it. Becca and Chris have individual lives. Like, you know, without the other one there, they wouldn't just be blank slates. You know, they, they have the other relationships with their family and friends and loved ones. They have uh, actual hobbies. They have hopes and dreams and stuff. Like, they are individual people, and at the same time, they do have genuine chemistry. There is, I didn't really mention it, but there is a love triangle with the two of them and Hunter, but it does end amicably. And basically, Becca just tells Hunter, like, look, I am I see you as a friend, but you did lie to me right at the beginning of our relationship. You didn't tell me about how you were a guide or anything, and I don't think that we would be able to start anything based on that. And then for the rest of the series, it just never even comes up again. Like, the two of them aren't compatible, so they just are friends. And I'm glad that they didn't drag that on for the entirety of the fucking series. <laughs> like I said, there is genuine tension at a few points in this book, especially at the climax. Because first we're like, oh, I really hope Becca doesn't get raped. And then after that, we're like, oh, okay, I hope Nick and Chris get out of their situation okay. And it, it just, it really works. Probably the biggest issue I have with this story-wise, and this goes for all the books in the series, really, is that the first half is pretty slow and pretty dull. Like, it, the intro is great, and there's a few little scenes that are interesting sprinkled throughout, uh, but it's just not that good for the first half. And then once you reach the 50% mark, it gets a lot better. And it just... I, I don't know, I read the whole thing in one day after that, so make of that what you will. And that goes for pretty much all the books in this series. Like, first half, dull, kind of slow, second, or not completely dull, but, you know, much slower and less interesting, and the second half is a lot better. The first book is also the one that is most obviously a Twilight clone. The others are less so, but I still feel like the label fits. And anyways, let's go to book two, which is Spark. All, all the titles start with an S. It's a little annoying, but whatever. Unlike the first book, this one actually follows Gabriel, you know, Chris's fire brother, and it almost entirely focuses on him and his life and his relationships. Like, Chris and Becca are basically background characters, not just in this book, but for the rest of the series, which really caught me off guard. Like, I think Becca, despite seeming like the protagonist in the first book, has like three lines of dialogue after the first book is over. I'm not even exaggerating when I say that. Like, it, it ends with that revelation that she's a fifth and that she has these crazy powers and then nothing becomes of that. Like, she <laughs> she never has to learn to use them. She never really 
does anything with them at all. It's 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 weird. And in fact, all the rest of the books in the series focus on different characters, so I I I don't know. I it caught me off guard at first and I wasn't the biggest fan, but honestly, each of the characters is done pretty well. Like it focuses on all their own unique struggles, their own relationships, uh, etc. And the story does still continue, it's just continuing while we, the audience, are learning more about these different people who were previously side characters that weren't, like, they weren't two-dimensional. You know, in the first book, Gabriel and the others do have some personality, but it doesn't really come out until we see things through their eyes. The main thing at the beginning of this book is that Gabriel just sucks at math. You know, he's not good at math tests, and he's just, he would be failing that class if it weren't for the fact that he usually switches with his brother Gabriel, or excuse me, with his brother Nick for tests, because remember, Gabriel and Nick are twins. And after doing some classwork in school one day, uh, he, they hand their papers to another student to grade, and the girl next to Gabriel, her name is Lane, uh, sees that he got every question wrong, and she actually changes some of them for him to help him out. Like, that is, you know, that's cheating, and so is switching with your twin, but, you know, that's something she does because she feels bad for him screwing up so badly. And basically, the teacher realizes that Gabriel has been cheating this whole time, and while he could probably go to the higher-ups and have him held back for at least a year or thrown out of school or something, he decides to allow him to make it up instead, and he just has him, okay, look, look, you can take your last test yourself, and if you do well, I won't tell anybody, basically. Which is a really good deal, all things considered. Now, the thing about this is that Gabriel isn't stupid, it's just that after his parents died, which, remember, he was like 12 years old when that happened, and it was in a house fire, which his powers started, and after, after they died, he was just super stressed out, he fell behind in school, and he just felt super isolated, and his brother Nick wanted to help him out, so that's how they started cheating, and they've just kept it up for so long that he has fallen five years behind in school, and it would be almost impossible for him to catch up at this point. And, excuse me, I should mention that he doesn't feel guilty over starting the fire that killed his parents, and nobody, excuse me, nobody blames him for it, but he does have these really negative feelings about how he can't control his powers, and about how there's nothing good that can come of them. He doesn't feel guilty about this, he's just lost. You know, which honestly makes sense, given all the shit he's gone through. And that's why he is a bit of a hooligan, and he gets into fights at school and stuff. And basically, <laughs> to put it very short, uh, he studies with the girl that sits next to him, Lane, and they fall in love. And she also has trauma from a house fire, but in her case, it wasn't a magical fire, she just got burned really badly all along the side of her body, and there's scars covering a bunch of her, and she has not been able to show that to people, and she just feels gross and ugly about it, you know, that sort of thing. So this book fo gives her a fair amount of focus, and it also explores all that, but it also explores her parental issues, because her mother is a terrible person, and her father is kind of distant, you know, he provides for them, and he's not a bad dude necessarily, but he is not there for her when she really needs him. And she also has a brother, and it focuses on his issues, because he's deaf, and that causes problems, but he's also gets bullied about it, and, and her father dislikes Gabriel, because he thinks he's a hooligan, and he's a bad influence on Lane, and like, look, there's just a lot going on here. None of this is bad individually. In fact, like I've been saying, I think it's handled quite well, all things considered. But there's just so much from these new characters. And every book is the same. Every book introduces a couple of new characters and we learn basically their entire life story and their entire inner world. I mentioned earlier there's a couple of spin-off novellas about this, and yeah, there are. Which I personally think would have been better for some of these characters, because they don't really have enough to fill an entire book, and having a spin-off novella which explores a beloved side character and their inner turmoil, that, that's kind of what spin-off novellas are for, but whatever. While all of this is going on, there's also a huge spate of fires that are starting all over town, and people believe it's an arsonist, but they don't know for sure at first. And basically, Gabriel and Hunter start going around, and Gabriel actually steals a fireman's uniform, and he starts trying to save people that are trapped in the fires. Like, at the beginning, there's a little girl trapped in a basement somewhere that the firefighters can't get to. He grabs her and gets her out because, you know, he, 
he has fire powers, the fire can't burn him, and in some cases he can actually hold it back, but he also notices that this fire seems to have actual intent behind it, it's like someone's pouring energy into it, and he notices that going forward as well, so it's, it's pretty clear early on that an elemental is doing this. At another point, a fireman breaks his leg and gets trapped, but Gabriel drags him out, and basically he's doing this, and people realize, okay, there's someone going around saving people, and they immediately assume he's the arsonist because he's just trying to play hero. And later they figure out that it's Gabriel, he gets arrested as a suspect, uh, but he gets uh, gotten off without any charges by Lane's dad, who is a defense attorney. Now, I do want to mention real quick, because th this is a small thing, but it did really bother me. So, Gabriel is 17, and Lane... <laughs> well, at one point it says she's 16, at another point it says she's 15. I guess the editor was just sleeping when they got to that bit, but whatever. The point is, uh, Lane's father, at a few points, threatens to have Gabriel charged with statutory rape for being in a relationship with her, even though they haven't actually had sex, so I don't think that would count as statutory rape. But also, it's not statutory rape, there's only a two-year difference, and they live in Maryland, which I, I, I looked it up, like, my search history now includes Maryland Age of Consent laws, thank you, Spark, but basically I looked it up and yeah, they, there's nothing illegal there. Whether she's 15 or 16, the age gap is not big enough that there could be criminal charges brought forward, and you'd think that as a defense attorney, Lane's father would know that? Maybe he's lying? I, I don't know. It was just a, it was a weird detail, okay? So whatever elemental arsonist is going around causing trouble, uh, while Gabriel and Lane are hanging out at Horse Barn, they start a fire there, and Gabriel saves her. And one thing about the powers in this series is that when they are surrounded by their element or where their element is nearby, it energizes them and it heals them, uh, but they can also take that energy and use it to heal other people. So... Fire, for instance, it, fire actually seems to be the most powerful in this regard, uh, but basically Lane seems like she's injured, so Gabriel takes a bunch of the energy from the fire that's nearby and uses it to heal her, and she winds up being okay. And when he does this, it actually heals all the scars that have covered like a third of her body for most of her life. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't like this. Like, I thought Lane's whole character arc was gonna be about how her scars are basically a physical manifestation of her trauma, but they aren't a big deal and they don't, her trauma, her scars don't make her a broken person or anything like that. She can just learn to accept it and learn to get over it, but instead it's just healed and all of a sudden like, oh, okay, she, she's all better now. And I mean, she does learn about elemental stuff pretty quick after this, but the doctors that examine her and see that the scars are gone and her parents don't, so... I'm not sure how they ever got around to explaining that to them, but whatever. The point is, I, I dislike that this whole thing boils down to, yep, we magically healed your scars and now you're pretty again. I just, I didn't like that. So the climax of this one is that there's a big fire at their high school and Gabriel goes in and saves a whole bunch of kids and he learns that there's an elemental that goes to their school. Her name is Kala and she's the one that's been starting fires. She's specifically doing it to lure the guides, but... Basically, Gabriel, you know, saves, I think they mentioned it was like 30 kids or something that he pulls out who would have died or at least been seriously injured uh, it, if he hadn't done anything. And everyone sees that and they realize, oh, okay, this guy we thought was an asshole loner actually is a good dude. And he finally realizes himself, oh, okay, not only can I use my powers in a good way, you know, to help people from fires, but I might actually have something to offer the world. And... That's basically the end of his character arc, which is how every book goes, but I, I do kind of wish that this had been spread out across the whole series so that now we're not just, okay, like, this character's done, let's move to the next, you know, you know what I mean? But I don't know, there, there's basically a moment near the end where the firefighter whose leg broke, who, his life he saved, uh, gets wheeled up to him and thanks him for saving his life, and Gabriel decides after that, you know what, I don't know what to, I want to do with my life, I think I'll become a firefighter, and... It's a very touching moment. It really is, because this kid who has no idea what he's doing and feels like he has no value is realizing he has value. Now, again, it's a good character arc, but the story barely progresses at all. You know, we don't learn anything more about the guides who are coming. Like, they talk with 
Becca's dad once, I think, and he just says, yeah, I'm gonna go into hiding, and that's basically what he does the rest of the series, like, he's barely even mentioned. Um, and then we find out, okay, there's a group of elementals who are trying to start some sort of war, but we really don't learn anything past that, and, well, that's kind of annoying. But let's go to book three, which is Spirit. This one follows Hunter, and I'm gonna have to be brief with this. Basically, he meets a new girl at their school named Kate, who it turns out is a guide. He doesn't know that at first, but she is also a fifth. She's a spirit elemental, and he finds out pretty quickly, okay, yeah, she's a guide. She's here to hunt us down. What now? And she is working with another guide. She's basically an apprentice guide, but she's working with a full-fledged one whose name is Silver. I, I assume that's a nickname or something, but they never say his real name, so all right. And Silver's a fucking psycho. He just straight up wants to kill all the elementals that he comes across. He doesn't just want to go after the ones that are dangerous or causing trouble. Like, he just wants them all dead. And at this point, I realized, like, okay, so there are different factions among the guides, and that's why they have to be wary about them. But there are also people like Kate and, like, Becca's dad who are not as enthused of the about the idea of killing people who haven't really done anything. So Hunter is really struggling at home because... His dad, uh, both his dad and his uncle, were guides, by the way. Yeah, that was mentioned earlier. I didn't really bring it up because it doesn't really tie any into anything until now. Uh, but both of them died in a rock slide a couple months earlier, and he's struggling really hard. Eventually, he gets kicked out of the house, uh, which he lives in with his mom and his grandparents, which is... It's honestly kind of forced, but whatever. He does st uh, stay on his own. He's homeless for a couple of days, but then he goes to stay with the Merrick brothers, and that's just where he lives the rest of the series, which I, you might be thinking, like, wouldn't CPS get involved or something? And, well, his mom does give her blessing after a while, and it's only a couple miles away, so it winds up being okay. So Hunter and Kate are getting a little closer throughout all of this, and we can see by this point, like, okay, this is how the pattern goes. Like, they're becoming closer, they're gonna fall in love, Presumably Kate being a guide is going to cause some tension and then we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, it's It seems like it'd be really obvious where it goes, but it actually isn't because there's a big attack on a carnival by some elementals, you know, Kala's there, and she seemingly dies in an explosion, but they never recover the body. That becomes important later. And this is also around the time that Hunter learns that Kate is a guide and he's like, well, what the hell are you doing here? And she finally tells him about like, okay, like, Silver's here, we're hunting you down, etc. And Silver comes after them, and there's a battle that ensues, and he shoots at them, and they flee, but Kate does die. You know, she dies of her wounds. This really caught me off guard. Like, it made me realize, okay, so this isn't just going to be the same formula every book. Like, bad things can still happen. The love interests aren't always safe. That's, that, that's not good. And Kate was also, like, in the middle of her character arc, such as it were. Like, admittedly, she got a lot less depth than a lot of other characters in this series did, but still, like, she was clearly trying to come to terms with the fact that being a guide is probably not entirely a good thing, and how was she going to figure out her own shit and try and f find a way to protect people from bad elementals while also not being a complete psycho like Silver is, but she just never gets the chance to do that. She dies. It's also during this point that Hunter tries to shoot at Silver, like just with a regular gun, but it won't work because Silver is using... Uh, remember, uh, spirit elementals have all four elements plus a little bit extra, and using his fire powers, uh, Silver is able to prevent a spark from forming when Hunter pulls the trigger, so the gun just won't go off. And I love little sh shit like that, you know? I, I love little uh, things in magic systems that you probably wouldn't think to use them for, but then you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, that's a clever way of doing it. I just, I love those. So Hunter and the others learn of a plot that Kala and some other elementals had started to blow up the school using some tunnels that were underneath it. And again, they're trying to lure in as many guides as possible so that they can start a war. And when they get there, they see that most of the people involved in it are just kids. You know, all the elementals are just kids. They're not adults that are running things. And they realize, oh, okay, maybe we should just tell them to stop and hopefully we can nip this in the bud before it gets too big. And then Silver shows up, there's a battle, there's a huge explosion, and all four of the Merrick brothers and Hunter kind of enter into a circle, which apparently they can do, and Hunter is able to direct all their powers to stop the explosion, 
and then Silver gets arrested, and that's the end of that book. Then we go to book four, which is Secret, and this one focuses on Nick, who is the heir elemental Merrick brother. And I, I do just want to note that, like I said, there are spin-off novellas. The first one is a prequel, which at least has some reason to exist, but then there are two others, which one follows Hunter, and it kind of introduces his character arc, but doesn't really do anything with it because it needs to happen in his actual book, which follows him. So then we get to the actual book, and it also introduces his character arc, but this time it actually follows through on it and brings it not to a conclusion, but to very close to a conclusion, because his doesn't conclude until the last book. So it doesn't really have a reason to exist. And same with Nick's novella, which follows him, and there's just, there's just those three. But it, it's just weird. You know, it, it introduces something, then does nothing with it, so it has no reason to exist. So the main conflict of this book is that Nick is gay and he's in the closet and he doesn't want his family or friends to know about it because, I mean, obviously it's a difficult thing to tell people about, but we as readers know that his family isn't really going to care, so it just feels like a waste of time, honestly. Now, in the last book, Silver was introduced, and I did like him because he's just a massive threat, you know? Again, he kills a major character, and he has these crazy powers, he apparently knows how to use them much better than the Merrick brothers do, and he's willing to do pretty much anything to kill them. And in the prologue, he's in prison, and another guide shows up, and I think, okay, he's gonna break him out of prison, and then they're gonna have more guys after them, but no, the other guy actually just kills Silver, and then he goes after them. And I don't even remember what this dude's name is, but he's not nearly as interesting. Like, he's equally as psychotic, sure, but we don't spend as much time with him, so it doesn't sink in as much, and I, I don't know, he fills basically the same story role, so I would honestly rather they had just brought Silver back and had two of them go after them. That would seem more dangerous. It would introduce more tension. I don't know. I just, I just didn't like the way they handled S Silver's character. Now, I'll just say right now, Secret is the weakest book in this series. Like, it's not terrible, but like with all the others, the first half is much slower and much duller, but the second half also still takes a while to pick up. It's only at the actual climax where things really get tense again. And the only good bit here is that we see more of Tyler, who, remember, was <laughs> part of the feud between his family and the Merricks, and he blames the oldest brother for his parents' death and his sister's death. And basically, we learn more about him, and we see that he's not, like, a horrible guy, really. Like, he, he's not a good person, necessarily, because he has done some really stupid stuff, but then they also realize, like, okay, he was a teenager, and he didn't have complete control of his powers, and we also did stupid shit at that age, so maybe we're not in the greatest position to judge. And we also learn at this point that when he found out his friend Seth and some of the others attempted to get <laughs> Becca, he just cut off contact with them and decided, okay, I don't want to be friends with those people anymore. So basically we realize, okay, he's not an awful, awful person. He's j there, There's depth to him at the very least. Not that being resentful for someone almost kind of sort of being involved in your sister's death makes it okay to attack them and their family. It's n it doesn't. It, it just doesn't. But it is at least kind of understandable. And we also realize that he blames himself partially because basically the way his sister died is that there was a big rock slide, which Michael, the Earth Elemental Brother, didn't cause it, but Tyler and some others think that he did. And, uh... Tyler and his sister and some others all get uh, pulled underwater by the rocks, and Michael dives in, saves a couple of them, and Tyler is one of the first people he saves, and Tyler was saying, wait, no, go save my sister, and he goes after, but by the time he gets to her, she's already dead, and so Tyler has some survivor's guilt about that. It really speaks to this series' ability to write interesting characters that this guy who is barely in the first three books only kind of a secondary character in the fourth and fifth books, and he still has this much depth to him and this many facets to him, and there's so many different interpretations you could make of him and his character. Like, th this author, I've never read any of her stuff before, but she really does know how to write characters, if nothing else. Like, I, I have criticisms of this series, obviously, but she is fantastic at that one thing. Anyways, there's a climax where that other guy attacks them, and he gets killed, and... 
Nick has a boyfriend, and he tells him about all the elemental stuff, and everyone's happy, and then they find out he's gay, and Gabriel's kind of a dick about it for a bit, but then he realizes, okay, he Nick is my brother, and I love him, so I guess it's not that big a deal, which is exactly how I knew things would turn out in the beginning, and then it's just everyone's happy. That's the end, and finally we'll go to the final book in the series, which is called Sacrifice. This one focuses on the final Merrick brother, Michael, the oldest, the one who has had to become a parent to his younger brothers since their parents died. And I'm gonna be honest, I think that was a mistake. Like, Michael has actually been the only brother who has been somewhat prominent in every book up until this point, <clears throat> and so we have gotten his development, we've gotten his personality, we know about him as a person, we know about his backstory, we know about his inner tur turmoil, and so this book doesn't add all that much to him as a character. See, I personally feel that the final book in the series, after all the other characters have gotten their own, which is focused on them, so we really know them as people, I feel like the attention of this one should have been split amongst all of them, so that they would all finally get their chance to shine when they're going into the final battle, and finally defeating the bad guys, you know? So basically in this one, the guides are becoming extra aggressive and attacking them even more and more and more, and they start blowing up restaurants, and they start blowing up houses nearby, and they destroy the Merrick's house, and no one dies, but it's destroyed and they have nowhere to stay now. And so because of that, social services come after them, and they take the younger boys to a foster home, and Michael is really, really freaked out about this. He, he's thinking like, okay, they're taking my family away from me, which kind of makes sense because, you know, his parents did die violently and he's probably very uh, nervous about losing his brothers as well. But at the same time, they're 16 and 17 years old and they're going to be nearby. Like, even if they got taken away to a foster home or something, they wouldn't go that far from him. So it does feel like he's freaking out over something that's not the end of the world. And of course, there is Michael's love interest for the story, who is Hannah. Now, Hannah's actually been around since the second book. She's been his girlfriend that whole time, but she just hasn't been a major character. And she actually had a son when she was like 17, and she's only 23 now. So, you know, she has a little guy running around. It's hard for her to date. It's hard for her to have friends and stuff. And her whole arc is basically about how she loves her son more than anything in the world, but she's just not totally satisfied being a single parent because of that isolation and that loneliness that comes from it. She also makes friends with a new fireman where she works because she is a fireman for this whole series, and his name is Irish, and while it kind of feels like they're trying to hint at a love triangle at a few points, it, it, it doesn't go that way. She's just friends with him, which was the best way to do it. But I mean, this is like I was saying earlier, you know, Hannah's character and character arc are really good, and I did enjoy them, but, like, th this is the climax of the series, and we're still introducing these new characters and spending all this time on the- or, not a new character, but we're spending all this time on side characters when the climax is coming up, like, the guides are coming after them, what are they going to do? Like, that, that should be the focus of this final book to me. So Michael is stuck in an explosion at a restaurant along with Tyler, and they're both injured, but they survive, and a bunch of other people die. And because of this, the boys, like I said, they got taken away to a foster home, and Tyler and Michael just decide to try and go after the guides, but then they also find out that the foster home was destroyed, and seemingly everyone in there died, so Michael thinks, oh shit, my brothers are dead now. And obviously he's upset about that. So Michael, Tyler, and Hunter all go to the woods where they think the guide is, and they find Kala, who is still alive, but she's been tortured for weeks, and then healed, and then tortured and healed uh, by the guide, and then he shows up and he immediately shoots her, and she dies, and they see who it is. It's Hunter's uncle! Which, I mean, this twist may have worked really well if we had gotten to know his uncle at all. <laughs> or had him even be mentioned more than like twice, but he just shows up and Hunter's like, what? Oh my God, you were supposed to be dead. And he's like, yeah, I faked my death. Now I'm gonna kill all these people. And then the other Merrick brothers also show up and it turns out they're alive. They, they could, using, using their powers, they were able to sense that something bad was happening and they tried to get the other foster kids out, but they were unable to do so. And now they want revenge on this dude. So they form another circle and they're attacking Hunter's uncle, and they nearly kill him, but then they notice that he has an explosive vest on, and that if they do that, it's going to go off and probably kill them, but also just destroy a huge area, and 
This part's not explained super well, but it seems like it would also, all the magic energy they're using would go out of control and cause like a tsunami or a big storm, which would kill a lot more people than just a bomb would. I, I don't know, it's not explained super well, but basically, a bunch of people will die if they just kill the dude. So Hunter, acting quickly, just redirects all the power to himself, and he instantly dies. Like, he's vaporized. There's nothing left of him. He sacrifices his life to save the others, and then Michael grabs a gun, shoots uh, his uncle, and kills him. And that's the end of that. Also, Hannah and her friend Irish are watching this, and this is when we learn that Irish actually is also an elemental, and his father tried to raise him to be a guide, but he left, and he mentions that a lot of the new generation of guides are less psychotic than the old ones, and they are trying to change things, but he also just wants to leave that life behind, and... I mean, I mean it's fine, I guess, but it doesn't really add anything. And, like I said, there's so many characters that already get all this development, we don't need to add one more. And then, at the very end of the book, they're at Hunter's funeral, and it turns out that Michael actually did lose custody of his brothers. Like, yeah, they're going into foster care for a while, but... I mean, remember, Gabriel and Nick are literally months away from turning 18, when they'll be gone, so... It's not that big a deal, I guess, and Chris is 16, so he'll be there longer, but it's still not forever, and it's not like he's going away and they'll never see him again. It's just they won't be able to see him as much. But Michael seems to realize this at the end as well, and he's come to terms with it. And basically, that that's it. Other than that uh, bit of him losing custody, it is overall a happy ending. And obviously, I did skip over a lot of things, but that is the gist of it. That was the Elemental series, and like I said, it was pretty good. It wasn't perfect, but I did really enjoy it. I mean... I'm just gonna have to bring up some of the issues I have now uh, with the whole series, and we'll just go from there, I guess. So, one big issue is that, like I said, after the first book, Becca is barely in this. Now, I, I would still say a Twilight, it's a Twilight clone because it's a young adult urban fantasy with a lot of romance, and it, it works pretty well, but again, like, this was the protagonist for a while, and then she just disappears, and... Excuse me, we also hear about how she has these crazy powers, but she never does anything with them, so what was the point of even revealing that? I, I don't know. Like, I, I don't even know if she shows up in the last book at all. And again, she was supposed to be the main character, but, you know, th this story of this, st uh, of this story is a little weak at times. Like, it gets really good at most of the climaxes. Like I said, there's genuine moments of dread and tension and panic, which work really well. Uh, but this series would just not have worked very well at all if it was not so character-driven. By the end of it, I really felt like I knew all of these people very, very well, even if I didn't necessarily want to know them very, very well. Uh, the romances all have genuine chemistry, and the only one that is a little iffy is one with Tyler, and I didn't really mention her, but Becca's friend Quinn, which starts up in the fourth book, and... Basically, he's 21 years old and she's 17, so that's a bit of an iffy age gap, but, I mean, it's, it, like I said, it's not illegal in Maryland, <laughs> so I guess it could be worse, and, I mean, again, this is a genre where it's not uncommon for men who are, like, hundreds of years old to be in relationships with teenage girls, so, b by the standards of this genre, it's really not that bad, and things don't really get sexual between them either, so I guess it... I, I don't know, it, I, I'm going on a long tangent now. Basically, all the romances have genuine chemistry and none of them are really toxic or anything like that, so I appreciate that. The villains all have a point. Like, the only ones who are, again, really cartoonish are uh, Becca's ex-boyfriend and his friends who just decide, oh, all right, let's get <laughs> at the end there, but all of the other villains, like the guides, have a point, even if they're psychotic in the way they go about doing it. Like. If you leave the elementals alone, some of them are going to do some pretty nasty things. And it, when you consider that there are like house fires and rock slides and stuff near where the Merricks are, it's easy to see how character, how people might think, okay, they're up to no good, let's eliminate them so they don't hurt anybody. And then, like I said, there's people like Tyler who, again, they act, uh, he acts way over the top in his violence toward the Merrick brothers, but when you re realize that his sister was killed and he not only feels some personal survivor's guilt about that, but his 
uh, he kind of blames the others for it, you realize, okay, like, this is why he's acting this way. So all of the villains kind of have a point. And the relationship between all four brothers, all the Merrick brothers, is great. It really is, because I've mentioned this before, but a lot of people don't seem to realize just how complex dynamics can get between siblings when there's a lot of them. Like, in most movies and books and stuff, there's usually only two, and so we know their relationship. And even if that's done well, which it is in many cases, it really does not uh, get into how complex it can be. So there's four brothers. Like, we have to know how Chris feels about Michael, Nick, and Gabriel. But we also have to know how about how all three of them feel about him. Then we have to know about how Gabriel feels about Chris, Nick, and Michael, and how all three of them feel about him, and then so on and so forth. Like, it's a complex web, and this series does a really good job of drawing that up. Like, they obviously all love each other, but there's more to it than that. And I don't know, the only other series I've seen that did this uh, well was Maximum Ride, where there were uh, six, or excuse me, I had five. There are six members of the flock in that, and this had a very similar dynamic. All of the individual books in this series are too long. Like, none of them really overstay their welcome, because they're not that long, but they all could have been trimmed down at least, like, 10%, I think, and we wouldn't have really lost anything for the story. Uh, more characters deserve focus, I think. Like, I know I was complaining about how side characters and stuff got too much, but, I mean, the first book is really split between Chris and Becca, whereas the other books are, like, all on one of the main characters, so it does feel like the two of them got left behind a bit. Honestly, if this whole series had been much shorter books and everyone focused on a different character, so we got one for Becca, one for the other five char uh, characters who all got focused on in this series, and maybe one or two more, then I think that would have been great. Uh, but we just, I don't know, we wind up in this situation where the individual books are a little bit too long and the series itself is a little bit too short because people like Becca and Chris just didn't get enough time to shine. And the characters all just kind of disappear after their arc ends, you know? Like, I've mentioned Becca and Chris a bunch before, but in after the second book, Gabriel pretty much disappears. After the th third book, Hunter largely disappears until, like, you know, the climax. And it's not that they're gone completely, but they just kind of are in the background and have a few bits of dialogue and conversations and don't do all that much, really, to affect the story. So I, I feel like this could have benefited from maybe being outlined better a bit better before the author started writing, but I mean, it really could be worse. And I don't know, I was, overall, I'm just impressed that this could be done. You know, I'm impressed that you could take a, a setup for a genre, which is almost universally just bad and mocked for very good reason, but th they could take that and genuinely make it good. And I don't know, just check, check the series out if you're curious. Like I said, I did leave out a lot of important details, so there should be stuff that surprises you and stuff that uh, interests you if any of this catches your attention. And I just want to end on this one last note, which is always be willing to give things a chance. You know, even if something is in a genre you don't normally like, or it's from an author you don't normally like, or a director you don't normally like, or just anything, if something seems like it might be interesting, give it a shot, you know? Always be willing to try out new things because that's how you find diamonds in the rough like this. You know, like, I don't want to be one of the people on BookTube who only focuses on, like, the new releases in order to try and maximize views. I don't care as much about that. Uh, I just pick what interests me, and sometimes what interests me is something that looks stupid but turns out to be enjoyable. So, I don't know. I, I don't have a <laughs> strong closer for this, but I hope that I may have brightened your day a little bit because the Elemental series certainly brightened weeks of my life, and I'll see you later. Goodbye. Hello for everyone who watched this far. All these names? Yeah, those are my patrons. Uh, special thanks to all of them, and especially a special, special, special thanks to all of my $10 and up Patreon names, people, who are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dio, Echo, Evie, Flax, Greg Grebo, Karkat Kitsune, L. Lindbergh, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Matthew Baudreau, Micaphone, Peep the Toad, Robbie Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Vevictus, and Wesley. Without you, I couldn't do this. If you want to get your name on here, consider donating to me on Patreon. Or 
you know, don't. I, I can't force you, I guess. Um, if you don't feel like doing that, you can always, you know, like the video and comment on it and subscribe to my channel and maybe become a YouTube channel member if that's how you feel. Okay, um, thank you uh, for all the thing. Goodbye.